my talk would be a combination of reading from the text, explanation, and some slides. So let's begin at the beginning. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Approximately 1,000 years ago, one of the greatest Muslim reformers, Abu Hamid Muhammad Ghazali, embarked upon a groundbreaking project of the reform of Islamic thought. The outcome of his endeavor was a hugely influential book called Ehyad Urumuddin, The Revival of Sciences of Religion. In the introduction to his magnum opus, Ghazali explains the reason for writing the book. And here is the uh, explanation in the introduction to his book. The religious learnings and sciences have become obsolete. The lights of guidance have almost disappeared from this world. They, and here he means the corrupt scholars who claim to be the genuine representative of religion, duped the people to believe that there is no other knowledge or science than of issuing fatwa, religious edicts, or jadam, the type of arguments which when glorious display in order to confuse or refute, or to the elaborate and flowery language with which the preacher tries to lure the common folks. He continues, on the other hand, the science of the path of hereafter, which our forefathers have followed and which includes what Allah in his book called faith, not to be confused with the current usage of this term, which in Allah's usage entails wisdom, knowledge, enlightenment, light, guidance, and righteousness, has vanished from among men and has been completely forgotten. Since this is a calamity affecting religion and a grave crisis overshadowing it, I have therefore deemed it important to engage in the writing of this book, to revive the sciences of religion, to bring to light the exemplary lives of departed imams, and to show what branches of knowledge the prophets and virtuous fathers regarded as useful. Now, by the end of uh, when, uh, century ago, uh, middle of uh, last century, Muhammad Erbal Dahuri launched his reform project. He chose a completely different title for his book. The book which he published was called The Reconstruction of Religious <coughs> Thought in Islam. Reconstruction. The book was published in 1930s. Now, the differences between the titles of the book and the content of the two books, as Abdel Farid Surush has noted, is of great importance. Why? For Ghazali, who belonged to the pre-modern era, reform meant revival of the sciences of religion. That is to say, re-examination, revision, and correction of some of the Islamic teachings which were prevalent among Muslims in that time. But for Iqbal, reform meant a reconstruction of religious thought. That is to say, a complete overhaul of the ways in which Muslims were understanding Islamic teachings. Iqbal had come to the conclusion that Muslims have become so alienated from the real spirit of Islamic teachings that only a radical paradigm change can help them to rediscover the precious treasures they had lost. Helmut developed his project of reconstruction, and I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with it, by introducing a new philosophical doctrine, namely the philosophy of Khodi. And that is to say, an ego who is like a Kantian agent, a rational, autonomous, and free self. A self who is supposed to walk in the footsteps of the prophet long after the time the prophet declared himself to be the last of the divinely appointed messengers who had brought the specific messages for the people. Erwan's ego is therefore not only a man of vision, but also a man of action, whose mission is to introduce a new model of modernity of which religion and spirituality are integral parts. In a lecture entitled, Is Religion Possible? which was presented 
in Aristotelian, at uh, the Aristotelian Society here in London in 1932, Ehrman had not only answered the question in the title of his talk in the affirmative, but went on to emphasize that only, quote, religion, which is essentially a model of actual living, is the serious way of handling reality. Subsequent generation of Muslim reformers who developed projects which were more or less in line with Erbal's approach sought each in their own way to bring about a complete paradigm shift with regard to the understanding of the intellectual content of the basic Islamic tenets and the appreciation of the meaning and significance of its pivotal practices and rituals. Our chair mentioned some names, Hamid Abu Zay, Muhammad Arkun, Abdul Karim Surush, Muhammad Mushtaid Shalistari, or some of the few pioneers who are working on this project, project of producing a new paradigm for reconstructing the Islamic thought fit for 21st century. To give you just a flavor of the sort of argument produced by the promoters of this new trend, let me very briefly introduce the main aspects of Abdul Karim Surush projects. Surush, by introducing theories such as the contraction and expansion of religious interpretation, the expansion of the prophetic experience, and the Quran as the outcome of the prophetic visions, has tried to challenge the official and orthodox reading of Islam. In his Reason, Freedom and Democracy in Islam, which was published in 2000, Surush introduced part of his epistemological project in the following way. Oops, sorry. This is something else. Yeah, this is Surush. Religion is in no need of reconstruction and completion. Religious knowledge and insight that is human incomplete, however, is in constant need of reconstruction. Religion is free from cultures and unblemished by the artifacts of human minds. But religious knowledge is, without a shadow of doubt, subject to such influences. Revivalists are not lawgivers, shara'a, but exegetes, shara'a. To treat religious knowledge, a branch of human knowledge, as incomplete, impure, insufficient, and culture bond, to try to mend and darn its wears and tears, is in itself an admirable and hallowed undertaking. It is this exercise that is called religious reform and revival. This trend, of course, not uh, this trend is of course not the only trend within the larger movement of reform in Islam, which had started many centuries ago. All other trends can be divided into two general categories, pre-modern and modern trends. And there is at least one important difference between these two categories. So, while Ghazali, Ghazali's efforts to revive the sciences of religion, like the efforts of those many other reformers who came even centuries after him, all belonged to a pre-modern paradigm and were mostly motivated by internal factors, and by that I mean factors which were based on considerations related to religious teachings and beliefs, what has happened in the world of Islam in the past two and a half centuries under the rubrics of reform, revival, regeneration of Islamic teachings has been mostly due to the encounter of Muslim societies with modernity. Later on in this talk, I shall give a brief account of modernity, or at least of the way I understand this phenomenon. But for now, I should like to provide a list of some of the major challenges which were <coughs> presented to Muslims in the wake of their exposure to modernity. Defeats of Muslim uh, armies in their confrontations with European armies occupation or annexation of Muslim lands by various European countries, introduction of Western rules, ideas, values, practices, etiquette, and customs to Muslims, all presented many difficult and painful questions 
to the followers of Islam. So, for example, they began to ex uh, ask themselves that if they were, as was stated in the Quran, the best nation ever brought forth to men, then why was it that now they had become subdued by non-Muslims? Why had the Europeans made so much progress in scientific and technological areas and have become powerful and wealthy, while Muslims had remained backward, weak, and poor? What were the root causes of Muslims not being able to live up to the standards expected of them by their religion? How could Muslims overcome their deficiencies and shortcomings and regain their lost glory? Now, even a cursory look at the history of the Muslim societies in the past 250 years reveals that in almost all Muslim countries and communities, reformers from different backgrounds and with different visions and ideas have tried to suggest possible solutions to the crisis befallen on their communities in the wake of their encounter with European nations who were exemplifying modern trends of thought and practices. These earlier responses present a wide range of intellectual outlooks and emotional reactions, from awe and wonder to fear and anxiety, to resentment and rage, to resignation and capitulation, to praise and endorsement, to rivalry and competition, to de desire for partnership and cooperation, to determination to fight and resistance, and so on and so forth. However, the majority of the reform projects introduced by Muslim reformers in different Muslim societies were, to a lesser or greater extent, carried out within the intellectual and faith-based frameworks which had many things in common with each other and with Ghazali's reform project. In other words, no more, none of these projects, not understanding the differences, which can be observed in the strategies and tactics, amounted to a genuine paradigm shift in Muslim societies. So this is my claim. All the other research pro programs or projects, projects for revival of Islamic thought, which presented by different Muslims in the past 250 years, have remained more or less loyal to a great deal of the old paradigm. What I'm going to discuss with you tonight is the, uh, the very general outline of a new paradigm. And I hope to be able to convince you that something new and radically different is genuinely emerging. In fact, as Hamid Enoyat has noted, since for many Muslim reformers, political issues, especially fighting colonialism and introducing political reforms, had priority over other issues, reflection upon the intellectual issues which were affecting Muslim societies did not receive the attention it required. To this, it can be added that even when Muslim reformers did turn their attention to the intellectual maladies afflicted Muslim societies, the solutions they produced were by and large within conceptual frameworks which were mostly informed by paradigms that were not radically different from <coughs> what with which the noise of Ghazali or Mullah Hassan Fezer Khashani who came some 600 years ago and still was in tune with Ghazali were familiar. To better explain the point I have in mind, I need to borrow a theoretical notion first introduced by Karl Popper in 1950s and was further developed by his colleague Emre Lakatush in 1970s. Of course, Lakatush used the notion without acknowledgement. The notion in question is research programs. Lakatush suggested that instead of the notion of paradigm introduced by Thomas Kuhn, we better use this notion, the notion of research program. Each research program consists of a hardcore which is, if you like, sacrosanct and should not be changed, and two sets of instructions. One, which is 
a negative set tells us not path to take. And the other one is the positive set. It is called uh, positive heuristic, which tells us which path we should follow in order to further develop our research programs. Now, within each research program, different theories could compete as long as they remain loyal to the hard core. And this is my point. All the projects for reform, which has been presented by Muslims in the past 250 years, belong to these research programs. They all are loyal to the hard core. The hard core, with which even Ghazali had many things in common. So they have made produce changes which are mostly in peripheries, but not with the hard core. The new projects, some of those promoters I mentioned, and this is one of, uh, if you like, uh, its manifestation, tries to challenge that very hard core and produce something of, if you like, a revolutionary approach to understanding this law. Okay. My challenge is that many of the models developed by Muslim reformers were parts and parcels of those research programs whose hard core has many things in common with pre-modern paradigms. The above programs and projects should be contrasted with Muhammad Iqbal program and those of few other Muslim thinkers who have, in their own ways, further developed approaches which are similar to Iqbal's approach in some important aspects. Iqbal could be regarded as the precursor of a totally new approach to the reform of the Islamic thought, whose main features is to challenge the basic principles of the dominant doctrinal paradigm amongst Muslims. Now, by dominant doctrinal paradigm, I mean the very paradigm whose hard core has been more or less preserved in the research programs or projects of the majority, though not all, of Muslim reformers in the past 250 years. The hard core in question can be identified by the following thesis or some variations on them, among others. A belief in the nature of the Quran as the exact words spoken to the Prophet by God. A belief in a strict understanding of the infallibility of the Prophet and Imams in the case of Shia Islam. A belief in a privileged status for a reformed faith among other religious sciences. A belief in the inseparability of religion and politics and a belief in a maximalist understanding of Quranic and Islamic teachings. I trust you're all familiar with this term, maximalist understanding, as against the minimalist understanding. The maximalist understanding claims that everything we want to know is there already. The reconstructionist trend, which goes back, whose genealogy I trace back to Iqbal, differs from all other responses produced by Muslims uh, in reaction to modernity uh, in that it is presenting a complete epistemological paradigm change. That is to say a complete overhaul of the way Muslims could understand the basic tenets of Islam and interpret its main sources. So this is the key. A new approach to the basic teachings of Islam and basic principles of Islam. It challenges the very hardcore of the research programs projects developed by Muslim reformers in the past two and a half centuries. Of course, it goes without saying that such a radical change implies a new look at politics, metaphysics, religion, religious experience, social norms individual rights and obligations, and many other aspects which together form a new proper paradigm, constitute a proper paradigm. One of the implications of the introduction of 
the new epistemological frameworks by modern reconstructionists of religion, of religious thought, is uh, that because in their view, this will uh, help to uh, the emergence of a new theology, and since Felp and Fogaha heavily rely upon theological theories of their time, a change, a radical change, in theological outlook could lead to a radical change in jurisprudential, jurisprudential practices. So this is another claim. Emergence of a new theology would lead to the emergence of a new look at jurisprudence and faith. The Islam, Modernity and the New Millennium, the book which we are discussing uh, some of its parts here, belongs <coughs> to the same modern discourse of reconstruction. Could you please remind me of the time? Because I haven't kept it and I have have got another one hour. I have <laughs> no, got <we> twenty minutes. <laughs> You see, I haven't even reached this fair of my paper. So I have 25. to ask you. Okay, thank you so much. I have to ask you. Uh, so this new approach uh, owes a great deal to a uh, school which is called Critical Nationalism, first introduced by uh, Austrian philosopher called called Popper, and by the way, one of its greatest exponents is with us tonight. Uh, Professor David Miller, who is there, is one of the best exponents of uh, critical rationalism, uh, perhaps the best. Okay. In what follows, I briefly introduce some of the main tenets of critical rationalism, and then explain some of the ways in which this epistemological framework can help mo modern Muslims in their task of reconstructing the Islamic thought. But before attempting that, let me say something about the title of my talk, which uh, may have uh, caused some sort of uh, ease. The phrase, are we there yet, apart from its known connotation in English, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that, implies a determinate destination. But of course, modernity is not a fixed destination towards which we are traveling or should be doing so. Although, admittedly, some Muslims and non-Muslims may regard it as such. It is for this reason that I have placed the phrase, are we there yet, in inverted commas, to just indicate that I actually intend to subvert this apparently popular misunderstanding. Modernity, as a socially constructed phenomenon or entity, is an emergent and constantly evolving construct, whose topography and contour as well as the internal relations between its various constituent parts are constantly changing due to continuous interaction between different actors and agents who are involved in constructing it. There is no pre-prepared blueprint or map for developing this construct. From what was said about, uh, about it follows that different types of modernity may emerge as the result of interaction between various actors in socio-political and geographical historical contexts. Nevertheless, for each of these different versions of modernity to be identified as a version of modernity, they should share something in common. And by that, I neither mean uh, Wittgensteinian family resemblance nor Aristotelian essentialism. What I mean is a number of common properties or functions which belong to all of these models of modernity. And perhaps those properties can be best explained by focusing on some of the mottos of some of the greatest architects of modernity. And here are those mottos. The first is by Immanuel Kant. Have courage to use your own intellect, which implies the importance of agency, autonomy, and freedom of the agent. The second is by Karl Marx. All that was solid melted into it. This implies the collapse of all institutions that manifested the pre-modern order, including the monarchy, the church, and the land-holding aristocracy. 
And the third belongs to Nietzsche. It's the title of one of his books, Human or to Human, human that implies that in modern times, people are on their own and must find out their ways by means of their human abilities. Of course, modernity is also identified by a range of, a range of other phenomena, including urbanization, industrialization, and the ever-increasing role of modern sciences and technologies in shaping people's lives, the importance of the rule of law, gender equality, human rights, plurality of belief systems, and the voices which can be heard in the public squares, and many more. One of the attributes of models of modernity, which is worth highlighting, is secularism. I uh, freely acknowledge and admit that secularism is a contested concept. For my part, I define secularism as tantamount to rationalism. And this means that use of our own reason to deal with whatever problem we are facing it. And because I equate rationalism with secularism, this uh, entails that there are seculars who are anti-religion and there are seculars who are pro-religion and there are seculars who are religion, religious. Okay. Now, contrary to what many sociologists of religion were thinking and claiming in the uh, 1960s, the advent of modernity not only has not led to the demise of religion and religious sentiment, it does not also entail such an eventuality. In fact, as Peter Berger and many other sociologists of religion who once were advocating the thesis of demise of religion have argued, the advent of modernity, and this is important, the advent of modernity has not resulted uh, in the demise of religion or forcing religion to the uh, private sphere. It has resulted in the creation of a secular sphere which now is in dialogue with the religious sphere. So some sort of uh, constant dialogue between two spheres has become possible in the advent of modernity. The reform project. Now, modernity, as Habermas has pointed out, is an unfinished project. It means that there are many potential scenarios and models yet to be unfolded and actualized as various agents continue to interact with each other and with their natural and socially constructed environment. The project which I uh, developed relies on critical rationalism. And let me very briefly tell you something about its main uh, aspects and tenets. So critical rationalism is basically a way of life and a philosophical outlook. It's a quest for knowledge and truth, for emancipation through knowledge and spiritual freedom. And it says the critical attitude seeks undogmatically to subject all attitudes, ideas, institutions, and traditions, along with all uh, so-called knowledge and so-called freedom to critical examination and appraisal. Now, critical rationalists emphasize the need to recognize everybody with whom one communicates as a potential source of argument and as reasonable information and to take the attitude that I may be wrong and you may be right and by an effort we may get nearer to the truth. Now, as a methodological framework, these are some of the main tenets of this school of thought. There is something, reality, not created by man's ideas, language, or conventions, which is, although mysterious, nevertheless, it is assumed to be comprehensible. Remember, Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about reality is, is its comprehensibility. So critical rationalists maintain that uh, reality is, in principle, comprehensible. Secondly, it says that all knowledge claims are conjectural and remain so until they are refuted. This means that human knowledge is neither absolute, nor certain, nor infallible, nor indubitable, 
and nor justified. This last point is important because this is another thesis of critical rationalism, which says justification of all types and forms is impossible. In fact, uh, Professor Miller has discussed this in some of his papers. Uh, there is one simple argument for this. Whatever you present as a justification for something, it itself needs another justification. So, at uh, infinite. Now, all observations are theory related, and there is no such a thing as a brute or naked facts. Knowledge advances in two complementary ways, via negative and via positive. By via negative, what critical rationalism means is all those theories which have been refuted so far. Through the reputation, we have learned something about reality, but in a negative way. We know that whatever shape reality is, it is not the way this refuted theory is telling us about. Why a positive law refers to those theories which have remained unrefuted despite our best efforts in order to expose their defects. Morality and ethics, sorry, morality, ethics, and growth of knowledge are closely connected. They go hand in hand. Pluralism, uh, in the sense of diversity of ideas and views and the existence of pluralistic knowledge econiches is of great importance to the growth of knowledge. Knowledge claims ought to be objective, and objectivity means public accessibility and public accessibility of claims. Thus, certainty is not an epistemic concept. It belongs to the realm of personal psychology. Okay. Now, how much? How am I have got? Another 25 minutes? No. <laughs> 15. 15. All right. Now, critical nationalism and the reconstruction of Islamic thought. The above epistemological approach can be used for the task of understanding and interpreting Islamic teachings in ways which are not only in tune with the sensibilities of modern times, but at the same time, truer to the genuine spirit of Islamic ideas and ideas. So this is my claim. Critical rationalism provides Muslims from whatever background with a much more effective way to appreciate their religions and to be at home with modernity, with modern times. The new approach, as can be expected, challenges many of the traditional and orthodox approaches to Islam. For example, in dealing with the Quran, which is the most important Islamic source, it rejects the widely popular view among a large number of Quranic exegetes, whether Shi or Sunni, concerning the method of Tafsir al-Quran by Quran interpretation of the Quran by the Quran. According to this new approach, the method of Tafsir al-Quran by Quran is either reduced to a trivial thesis or it refers to an impossible task. <coughs> From a critical nationalist point of view, to understand the Quran, one should appreciate that the Quran is a text with considerable logical depth. The notion of logical depth is borrowed from the field of informatics and theories of information. Charles Bennett at IBM has defined the notion of logical depths in the following way. Logical depths is the plausible number of computational steps in an object's causal history. A logically deep object, in other words, is one containing internal evidence of having resulted from a long computation or from a dynamical process requiring a long time for a computer to simulate. Now, to help you to better appreciate the importance of this definition, uh, let me give you the example of these two skeletons. One is a picture of a real skeleton, a skeleton of a real man. The other one is a toy skeleton, a wooden skeleton used for educational purposes. Now, suppose you are a medical doctor and you want to know more about features of human skeleton. Now, this skeleton, assuming that it belongs to someone who has recently passed away and so to 2018, 
has been in the making for, according to the latest theories of cosmology, 13.7 billion years. 13.7 billion years took for the cosmos to create this. So layer by layer by layer, this skeleton has preserved that long history. You scratch each layer, new information would reveal to you. That other skeleton, assuming that an artist or a carpenter has made it an hour ago, has got a very, very shallow logical depth, just about an hour. The time the carpenter spent to create it. Of course, I'm talking about its depth with regard to the information it gives us concerning skeletons, not concerning the information of the wood as wood, because yes, as wood, it has been in a long journey just like the skeleton itself. Okay. The Quran's rich content can best help us in furthering our knowledge with regard to the universe of the human condition. This is where Quran can help us. And my claim is that Quran can help us in three ways. First, it can act as a judge to expose the defects in conjectures suggested by us as solutions for problems related, related to the universe of human condition. Let me explain. Quran, as a text, doesn't talk. We, readers of the Quran, should help it to talk to us. But how do we do that? We can only do that by starting from a problem, developing a conjecture as a solution to that problem, provided the conjecture and the problem are related to human conditions, not, for example, the problem in quantum mechanics or uh, advanced algebra, no, human condition. And the Quran is a source for challenging our solutions. So we go to Quran, we present our solution to the Quran and see whether the Quran corroborates our suggested solution or refutes it. I don't have time to go into details, but I have discussed it in the book. There are plenty of examples how Quran can help us in that way. The second role of Quran is as a source for heuristic insights concerning general directions, frameworks for possible solutions for the problems related to, again, the universe of the human condition. And third, as a source for introducing new problems related to the category of human condition. So three functions for the world. As a judge for other conjectures, as a heuristic source for insight or possible solutions, and as a source for new problems. The above three ways which the Quran can be studied is equally applicable to, of course, the study of Ahadith and Ravoyat. At this juncture, it seems to be useful to address two possible objections, which may be raised to my approach to the Quran. I told you that, according to cultural rationalists, all knowledge is conjectural. And the Quranic uh, lexicon, it is called than. But Quran on many occasions says that that is not acceptable. You should reject it. So that is not something good. So let me give you some examples of that. So here is one. And total excellent and art, you the do cancer in law and yet tabuna and that. If thou obeys the most part of those on earth, they will lead thee astray from the path of God. They follow only surmise, merely conjecture. And there are plenty of other uh, verses like this. I don't take you there. So most of them just follow conjectures. Also, I told you that certainty is not like an epistemological category. It belongs to personal psychology. And yet, Quran has given strong 
heavy weight to the notion of yaqeen. You see, here is one. Rabud rabbeka hatta yatiyaka biyaqeen. And worship your Lord until certainty comes to you. And then, kallalu ta'lamuna ibn yaqeen la tarawuna jahim thumma la tarawuna ayna yaqeen. No, indeed, were you to know with knowledge of certainty, you shall surely see her. Again, you shall surely see it with the eye of certainty. So, according to the Quran, straight away rejects my theory. Neither conjecture, nor certainty. So what can we do? However, the closer and more careful reading of the Quran mm -hmm. makes it clear that the Quran makes a distinction between conjectures which are misguided and misguiding and conjectures which are on the right track. So, there are plenty of verses in the Quran in which a plan or conjecture has been used, but if you look at them carefully, you will realize that there are two types of conjectures in the Quran. One type of conjectures the Quran fully endorses and tells you that, yes, you can carry on. There are other types of conjectures which, yes, Quran will say, no, you should avoid. Let me give you some examples. There are plenty of examples, but you are just two. It says that seek you help in patience and prayer for for forgiveness it is, say to the humble who conjecturally reckon that they shall meet their Lord and that unto him they are returning. You conjecturally believers conjecturally know that they are going back to God and because of that they do prayer and they do fast. And here is another one. Uh, said those who conjecturally reckon they should meet God, how often a little company has overcome a numerous company while God did. And God is with the patient. And here is another one. Uh, and the veil comes forth unto them from every side and they conjecture that they are overwhelmed therein then they cry unto Allah, making their faith pure for him only. If thou deliver us from this, we truly will be thankful. Okay. So, there are conjectures which Quran endorses, and critical nationalists talk about those type of conjectures. With regard to the notion of certainty, again, if you look at the Quran carefully, you realize that, first of all, Always certainty is something personal. Secondly, certainty as Quran itself suggests comes in gradation. Thirdly, and it is important, even for an individual in the highest level of certainty at this moment, that certainty is not the final stage of certainty. Certainty which is something the individual must constantly build upon and ascend to the higher and higher and higher stages of certainty. There is just one, oh yeah, sorry about that. Uh, there is one verse here, as well as Ibrahim, Rabbi Arani Kaifa, Togel Mota, Qala Abraham Tomen, Qala Bala Walaken, Ayat Vahinda Qad. When Abraham said, show me Lord, how you will raise the dead, he replied, have you no faith? He said, yes but just to reassure my heart. So certainty was something personal. Now, from the point of view of the approach introduced in the book, the construction of religious thought in Islam uh, from this uh, point of view, religiosity and criticality go hand in hand. I argue that all religions, whether Abrahamic or non-Abrahamic, consist of two main parts. So, now here is another major claim. All religions have two major parts. The first part, which could be regarded as intellectual aspects, consists of two set of statements. First, the realm of being has a master or a lord, this is a metaphysical claim. Of course, in the case of each religion, it can be adjusted accordingly. Secondly, the master of the realm of being is in principle knowable. This is the epistemological. 
all the rest in all religions, which is the practical technological aspect, which consists of all rituals, all practical practices, and so on and so forth, belong to this second aspect. And this second aspect actually creates some sort of uh, form of life, and that form of life gives identity to the followers of that particular religion or a denomination within a particular religion. So, the first part are shared by all religions. Second part is particular to each and every individual religion. And this is this part, which gives us a specific religious identity. Okay. Now, another point which I have discussed in the book is that critical rationalism, uh, which helps us interpret religion in a, a new light, helps uh, religious people to tackle the malaise of nihilism. Nihilism is something which uh, can be called uh, great illness of modern times. Now, I claim that religious people, especially if they are uh, equipped with this new intellectual framework, are be better uh, placed to tackle, to respond to the challenges of nihilism. To better understand that, I should introduce something which is called doomsday scenarios. But those doomsday scenarios are, are discussed by a number of scholars, including Samuel Schiffler in his book, Death and the Afterlife. One of, uh, example of doomsday scenario is this. Just imagine that in a month time, a huge asteroid would hit the Earth. It is on course to hit the Earth, and there is no way to avoid it. Just, just think about it for a second. We are all doomed. If that is the case, then this is what this is what Scheffler tells us. He says that if we were to learn that there was no afterlife, if we were to find ourselves in the doomsday scenario, of the point I just gave you an example, the conjecture says a wide range of things that now matter to us would no longer do so. If something is going to annihilate the whole Earth in a month's time, then you definitely will not think about buying a new house or decorating your uh, living room or filling your uh, wardrobe or even writing your next book. <laughs> so... That's for you. Yeah. <laughs> we would no longer value them, where valuing involves cognitive, motivational, and affective elements. We would lose confidence in the belief in their value. We would see ourselves as having weaker reasons to engage with them. And we would become emotionally dead end to them as if by depression or hunger. Now, it can be argued that the above sense of despair and hopelessness is more likely to afflict those who do not believe in a benevolent God who takes care of those who have lived a genuinely moral life. As Immanuel Kant had argued, those who believe in God and live a moral life, when they encounter nature's might in the shape of calamities and disasters, would neither despair nor fear, because to paraphrase Kant, no fear to become 
uh, they, they become conscious of their superiority over nature within themselves and without themselves and can fear, fearlessly but with respect stand before God because of their moral awkwardness. This point has also been nicely captured in the following verse of the Quran. I hope I have got the correct no, sorry. So the, the last verse. Ya ayatahu nafsun mutamayla erji ira rabbi ke raziyat ham alkiya fat kuri fi abadi fat kuri jannat. O thou soul at peace, return unto thy Lord, content in his good pleasure, enter thou among my bondmen, enter thou my garden. The approach developed in the book towards the constructing of a, of a reconstruction of religious thought in Islam deals with a range of diverse issues including dangers of literalism, i.e. Uh, uh, attaching to the apparent meaning of the Quran or Ahadith for a healthy reconstruction of Islamic thought and a successful reform of Muslim societies, a discussion of main Achilles heels of the traditional schools of Islamic philosophy, clarification of the epistemological status of faith. Here, for example, I discussed that faith, contrary to what Fogaha say, is not a science or knowledge, it's a technology. And I discussed it why, what I mean by technology. So faith is not a knowledge garden in discipline. There is also a discussion of the root cause of doctrinal violence, whether secular or religion, uh, religious, a critical assessment of possible models of Islamic democracy and Islamic civil society, a critical appraisal of the relationship between religion and science, a defense of pluralism and re rejection of exclusivist approaches, especially amongst followers of the Abrahamic religions, a critique of rampant relativism, whether epistemological or moral, and many more. However, admittedly, the above themes just address some of the issues and challenges which are faced by Muslims in modern times. My hope and plan is to follow up, provided that, that Oswald is not coming, to follow up the present volume with subsequent publications which aim at tackling a range of other pressing challenges. Thank you for your patience. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is a, this is a record for me because I never ever <laughs> managed to do this. I'm Always. sure you can do better next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, that, you that had is, an entire tear. Of course. That is, that is something which good coach would tell to the players. Okay. Yeah, you can do better. Thank you so much for this very comprehensive introduction and a very thought-provoking um, so uh, talk. I'm sure there are a lot of questions and comments. And the floor is open. I would kindly ask you to keep your questions and comments short so that we can have as much... We can reach the reception as, as soon as possible. <laughs> yeah, <that's good. laughs> we still you. have, I think, half an yeah, hour, 25 okay. minutes, uh, but just to get as many questions and comments as possible. I see a hand there. Hi. Can you please? Yeah. Oh, the microphone. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you did a touch on the problem that now today, uh, Charlie pointed to Saudi Arabia in the of Islam. And of course, the problem with Islam today is that you know Saudi Arabia is dominating a lot of the um, you know Islamic world with its uh, oil money. And secondly, when you say about the Quran, how to get the message of the Quran, the problem of abrogation, that the Medina Quran is has more uh, uh, weight than the Meccan Quran. And this is what Master Muhammad Abu Zayd tried to say. You have to reinstate the Meccan Quran, which teaches the equality between men and women. Oh, thank you so much. Would you, yeah, you collect yeah, 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 Because I have got a short memory. Mm -hmm. So oh, I better, right. no, 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 I better answer this now. Yeah, okay. uh, first of all, uh, yes, you're right. Uh, Saudi Arabia's version of Islam is dominant. My approach and the approach of those to whom I refer aims at a complete change in the outreach, intellectual outreach. Uh, that is, I admit, not an easy task. Perhaps it is a somewhat elitist project because it talks to the more learned strata of uh, Muslim societies. But if it happens, 
then all its benefits would trickle down to the masses. The aim is to educate Muslims uh, to be able to better understand and interpret the text. You noted that I mentioned literalism and taking apparent meaning as the final is completely unacceptable because as critical rationalists argue, all types of observations, including reading texts, are already theory related. So even the so-called literalists, unbeknown to themselves, are interpreting the texts. That point needs to be hammered in to bring home to them and tell them that, look, if you are low for interpretation, then you should be more open. Now, with regard to the uh, last woman of Z, yes, actually in the longer version of this paper, which hopefully will be published soon, I had discussed his ideas. My approach to the Quran encompasses his approach. So my approach is neutral with regard to, you know, remember Zay uh, talks about Quran not being just a nath, just not a text. It is an ongoing, it was an ongoing dialogue between God and his messenger. The text we have got is a fossilized version of that dialogue. And he tries to bring to our attention that if we look at the Quran as a dialogue, our viewpoint would change and new meanings would be revealed to us. That's why I entirely agree with him. However, in my approach, what I'm saying is that it doesn't matter whether you take the Quran as a text or as an ongoing dialogue, as long as you begin with your problem and then go to the Quran and ask the Quran's idea as a judge, then you will be able to learn quite a lot in this new light. So that is a completely new uh, approach to the Quran. But you should read the text and see uh, details of the argument and the examples which I have given there. I was very intrigued when you used the word expression, get away from hardcore principles. When you mentioned something about infallibility, uh, other thing was out of my depth, you say, but I would like you to explain that. Please. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to explain <laughs> myself uh, before being condemned as a non-believer. Now, many <laughs> traditional Muslims, and I can give you even great names. I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the great exegete of the Quran, Alame Taba Tabayi, which is Al-Mizan. They define infallibility of the Prophet and Imams in a very, very strict sense. They maintain that they are infallible in all aspects of life. And they are infallible by birth. So that is a God-given endowment to them which sets them apart from the rest. That I completely disagree with. And I explain to you why. I mentioned Iqbal. Other reconstructionists also have uh, noted this point. The Prophet is a role model for us. But if according to those interpretations. He has come to this world, which has right from the beginning sets him apart from me, then what sort of role model is he? One thing which I agree, the Prophet is infallible in receiving the message and imparting it to us. That I agree. In all other aspects of his life, he was just like us. However, as a highly moral agent, a highly moral agent, he acquired a high degree of infallibility with regard to things which ordinary people make mistakes of judgment. For profit, right and wrong, good and bad, 
was crystal clear because he had practiced it all his life. For me, as a novice who doesn't know what is right and what is wrong, mistake is very, very, very possible, probable. For him, because he has trained himself more than 40 years. You know, 40 years it took for him to become capable of receiving the message. By then, he had trained himself to the extent that he would he was able to discern between right and wrong and many other things. So that is that is what I mean by challenging those conceptions. Not the hardcore themselves, the conceptions about the hardcore. What about other hardcore principles? Whatever, whatever hardcore you suggest, there are mis misconceptions about it. Think about what ISIS is telling us about the main tenets of Islam. I completely disagree with their interpretation. So the hardcores, no, of course the hard the hardcore is there. People's interpretation of the hardcore should be challenged. And this is what I'm challenging in my book. Thank you very much for stimulating us read your book. I hope so, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I'm just wondering what you know what what depth of your how far your commitment to critical real critical rationalism goes. Very much. Okay. You're very well, deep. Well, it doesn't go, it seems to me, from what you just said, to the question of the authority of the Quran. That sounds pretty dogmatic to me. And I suppose I'm wondering, do you have a critical, rational approach to why you feel that warrant, uh, that, that, that you can give that authority to the Quran? Or is this really a dogmatic statement and the Quran tells us that we must be critical, rationalist in our, in our various uh, intellectual inquiries, because that's a rather different thing. Oh, Does so it go much. all the way, or is it, is it just a kind of, this is God's will for us? Thank you so much for that interesting question, which is like a banana skin, uh, tender made to just a stick. Good question. Uh, no, critical rationalists, as was suggested there, would not regard anything as if like <coughs> beyond the reach of critical assessment. But, the Quran, I discussed this in the book. Think about the Quran as just a reality outside there. Quran is a written reality. Reality outside there is material and perhaps non-material part of reality. None of us, fallible individuals with limited cognitive ability, have got direct access either to that reality or to this reality. I don't have direct access to you, or to this glass of water, or to the text of the Quran. What is the thing to which I have got access to is the interpretation of that reality or this reality. Interpretations are definitely not fallible and not beyond reproach. They can easily, not only easily, they must. They must be subjected to the harshest critical assessments. And there is no interpretation which is sacrosanct. All interpretations, because they are made by us fallible human beings, must be subjected to critical assessment. So that is my position. But the authority of the Quran itself, what makes it a different sort of book from, from your book, for instance? Oh. How, do you, how do you come to the conclusion that it speaks with God's authority? A, a very good, a very good uh, question. Again, remember, how do we understand the environment? How do we understand each other? How do we understand reality? We go by our conjectures we test our conjectures, if they remain corroborated, we regard them as knowledge well positive. There is a conjecture which says that this book has been given to us by God, which you remember is one of the planks of all religion. 
Um, I have a problem with the use of the term modernism. <laughs> oh, modernism is different from oh, modernity. modernity. Yeah, or modernity. If you're using it in a very value-laden way, it reminds me of the use of terms like oriental despotism and so on. I do not necessarily think present day modernity is better than what went before or what will come. So I think we have to find a new term to express human advance in knowledge, not necessarily positive because it has degenerated into negative episodes as you see now with the rise of Trump and so on. Uh, I don't think you can call it civilization anymore. So I think we have to be careful with this. Thank you so much. But I guess, I guess you misinterpreted what I had said. In none of my slides, I put any value on modernity. I define modernity by three motives. One was to rely on your reason. The other one was nothing remains solid and the other one was everything has been left to us. I mentioned Erbar, uh, which is your uh, sick name. Uh, Erbar has got this nice poem in one of his uh, Persian books of poetry. He talks about the Prophet Sallallahu He describes the Prophet as a copper, you know, a copper gives a divine wine to us all. And he says, I say it in Persian and then I translate it in English, he says that Dad Mara Akharin Jami ke dasht forsat saagi gari ba ma gozasht. Which rough translation goes like this. The Prophet gave us the last cup which he had, and that refers to his end of prophethood. He is being the last prophet. Gave us the task of being the cup bearer for the rest. After him, we should take the responsibility of act as followers of the prophet, messengers of the message of God. Now, this is happening when you become, as Kant has suggested, aware of your power of reason and come out of the yoke of tutelage. One of the characteristics of pre-modern time was that people were under the tutelage of authorities, as was suggested over there. One of the aspects of modernity is that it challenges authorities. This, I think, in itself is a good thing. However, when you take the responsibility to challenge something, of course, you must be ready to face with the consequences. You have accepted the burden. You should then be ready to follow up what happens next. So, I think that I did not put any value on uh, modernity. Actually, when I said there are models, <laughs> models of modernity, there are different modernities, this means that making value judgment between them is a second order task, i.e. we should compare and contrast and I'm not saying that all models of modernity are on a par. No, on the contrary. Actually, in the paper, I have argued the following. Immanuel Kant is one of the greatest architects of modernity, and I'm sure many of you have read his book, Reason Within the Limit of Only, sorry, Religion Within the Limit of Only Reason. There, he is trying to develop a model of modernity in which the sacred is at the center. He is saying that this model of modernity is worth working on. So, of course, that is a pretty good value judgment, and I go with Kant. 
we are in a position to judge different between different models of modernity and choose those which are conducive to better results. When you pointed to the first element, which is of your kernel, as the uh, problematic, one of the five problematic aspects, and that was with the literalist approach to the Quran, right? And then, I mean, echoing the previous question, then you used other ayat to actually prove your points. So, um, your students, who are also my students, are very familiar with how Fuqaha deal with these issues, issues of authority of the text, issues of epistemology of the text, text issues of heuristic or hermeneutics, actually, better, of the text. So, from your outset, I, I thought that that was a question on the authority of the text. This is how do we rethink this, you know, complex articulation of things, right? But then when you then were given the explanations, it's, it progressively became clear to me that it was a matter of hermeneutics. So is it, is it there where you're actually looking at? Because if that's what you're looking at, it's like a different hermeneutics of the text, then lawyers would tell you that lawyers have actually gone at extreme length to offer different interpretations of the text and stretch it here and there to come up with different solutions. But there are certain things that that kind of um, engineering or technology, as you call it, does not go beyond. So if you restrict yourself, so you, you challenge the Baha on their, you, the technological use of their, their knowledge. But if you yourself are doing the same thing, just offering a different uh, um, hermeneutics of the text, I don't still, I don't, I would still, you know, there on the pumpkin. Many thanks for that very intelligent, uh, important question. And again, thank you for giving me the chance to clarify my position. With all due respect to lawyers mm -hmm. and for uh, uh please allow me to tell you that I. But you, of course, because you're teaching, lawyers and Fogaha are not men of knowledge. They are engineers. And let me elaborate what do I mean by men of knowledge and engineers or technologists. Knowledge and technology are completely distinct entities, both man-made, but two different products of men. Knowledge has got just one aim, and only one aim. It aims at telling us what is out there in reality. That is the only aim of knowledge. Technologies of all shapes and sorts and types have two main functions. So, knowledge responds to our cognitive need, and on the cognitive need, we want to know what is out there. Technologies, on the one hand, respond to other non-cognitive need. For example, the very chair you are sitting on is a product of technology and respond to a non-cognitive need of yours. You want to be comfortable while you are in this company. The glass of water I'm using is another product of technology respond to another non-cognitive need of mine, quenching my thirst. The clothing we wear and the building we are in, they are all examples of technologies which respond to our non-cognitive needs. Some other types of technology respond to our, no, facilitate our cognitive pursuits, which is the task of knowledge, but just as mere tools. No technology, no technology would act as a piece of knowledge. No. Technologies, the second type of technologies, as tools facilitate our pursuit of knowledge. The glasses are there when I try to read is a technology of the second type. The telescopes which we use to look at heavens 
is the technology of second type, facilitate our pursuit of knowledge. The laptops we use is technology of second type. Now, technologies, contrary to knowledge, which respond to the answer, what is out there, respond to the following. How could we change reality to make it serve us better? No knowledge would tell you what to change or how to change at all. Knowledge only tells you what is there. That's it. Technologies tells you, tell you what to change. And because of that, all technologists and engineers are in the business of changing reality, dealing with practical issues. For Raha and lawyers, all deal with practical issues. No lawyer, no lawyer, no fari talks about what is out there. No fari whatsoever as far as he wears the hat of fiqh, not the, for example, Ghazali was a fari and at the same time a great theologian, a great philosopher, a great mystic and so on. As a fari, he only deals with your practical need as a religious individual. You ask a fari, what should I do in the long day of summer in the UK when I have to fast? I can't tolerate it. Fari tells you a practical solution. You ask him, I'm an astronomer uh, moving around the, uh, orbiting the Earth. How could I do my prayer? He gives you a practical solution but always practical solutions. So, no fari would interpret hermetically or non-hermetically. <coughs> of course, hermetically. I'll tell you what is the difference between non-hermetics and other types of hermetics. No fari would apply the tool of hermetics to find out something about reality as it is. It is always directed towards some practical Use. Can I just jump in here? Yes, yeah, please. How do you differentiate the two? I mean, is it that the, the that practical solution is related to that knowledge or based oh, on that course, knowledge? Of course, of course. All, by the way, I'm an uh, engineer myself. <laughs> All oh, engineers. so you're projecting. Now I get it. I didn't know this part. Okay, there you go. Now it's clear. All, all engineers, of course, have been okay. trained in physics chemistry, computer sciences, and many other sciences, they use that knowledge for practical purposes. So, for example, as an electronic engineer, I had to study in depth Maxwell theories of electromagnetic. But Maxwell theory of electromagnetic is a theory. If you talk to any engineer, the engineer will tell you that, look, I use that to make this antenna. This antenna is something practical. No engineer will tell you, I'm going to discuss about the nature of those waves. No. Discussion about the nature of those waves is the task of scientists. Okay? <laughs> Let me just finish my comment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't come back to you. <laughs> you have to keep it short. Sorry. Now, hermeneutical approaches are unfortunately mostly, if not all, only deal with the issue of meaning. For critical rationalism, language and meaning is just a tool. What is important is the notion of truth. Truth about reality, whether the reality of the text or reality outside. My approach is all about understanding what is out there. Of course, after that understanding, you can apply to practical issues, and that is the task of Fogaha. And by the way, Quraha are limited to just a very tiny part of the Quran. Those 500 verses which deal with... Yeah, but they're longer than the others. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, we will discuss I'm it later. we have only time for one question. Yes, this is Professor Miller. The and... chance to Professor Miller while you divide <laughs> the <laughs> But then we don't ask our questions because we're not going to tell you <laughs> something that I hoped you know. 
I, I simply do not agree with you that, that scientific knowledge, or knowledge when it's what is used in technology in the way that you... you no, I agree. Suggest, no, 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 thank you so much for that. But you do not design an antenna using knowledge of physics. True. The, the scientific knowledge is used to eliminate mistaken designs, not to produce new designs. So one has to take the critical approach here into technology and realize that knowledge does play a role in technology, but only a negative one. Yeah. Thank you so much. I thought, yeah. I thought I'd thought i this a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah, actually, I have learned... Obviously, you don't take me as an authority. No, thank you. <laughs> actually, I have learned it from you. Yes, let me just very quickly. Uh, yes, yes uh, Professor Miller is quite right. Uh, knowledge only tells us the limits of our practical action. So, for example, the law of conservation only tells us we cannot make a perpetual um, working machine. And the law of entropy tells us that no machine can have an efficiency which goes 100%. It will always uh, remain below that. Yes, scientific knowledge only tells us the limits of our practical abilities. And scientists, yes, by the way, do not use that directly, they use their intuition. But the knowledge is there in order for them not to make a mistake. Yes, thank you for correction. <laughs> so thank you so much. This was really a lively Q&A session. Uh, please join me thanking Professor Paya once again thank for the so talk. Much. and. <laughs>